And we will start this morning with the Irish Independent that goes with Lancaster rules out role with Ireland's coaching team. So Stuart Lancaster speaking yesterday about the possibility of going in potentially with Andy Farrell in the next Ireland coaching ticket. He says it won't happen. He says the reality is he needs it in place for January 2020. That is Farrell's coaching ticket. I'm sure he'll do that. But I said consistently, I enjoy the day-to-day -day stuff here. I enjoy club coaching and I'm very lucky to be at a great club the sort of addictive nature like I, I often think right now what what is Joe Schmidt thinking other than you know the what, what's going through his head about the idea of how things have gone so badly wrong for Ireland over the past couple of weeks I'm sure he's also thinking about the frustrations that he's an international coach and actually can't rectify what's gone wrong uh, for another six months really to actually kind of uh, put things right whereas Stuart Lancaster is speaking here today that he loves the day to day stuff that the kind of regular nature of club sport in any code really is such a positive for somebody who's kind of an addict of the game very much so yeah and uh, it, it's it's kind of like f friends of mine who um, who've turned to um, betting on sport and maybe doing a Professionally, it's, I've always said like if if there's no Irish racing for, for between Sunday and Thursday, and um, you're you're struggling for winners, you've this you've no time to, to make. You just have to wait and wait and wait. And I imagine it is completely different ball game. And like Joe Schmidt, considering the adulation f up until the start of the Six Nations campaign and the utter catastrophe that the Six Nations has been, the last thing he wants is a long break. You know, he may want that in terms of. Um, trying to rectify the problems but I'm sure he'd prefer a game next week to at least um, put some right to the wrongs and I, I, it just must be a completely different philosophy as, as well as that in football you know Mick McCarthy's obviously just into this now he's been out of that sort of game for a long time it suits some coaches it doesn't suit others yeah, for sure. Mm. Uh, the other story there in the back of the Irish Independent this morning is that Andrews has suffered a broken jaw. It's Paddy Andrews. He's going to be out for at least six weeks. He sustained a broken jaw as a result of Niall Morgan's challenge in Tyrone's victory uh, against Dublin on Saturday. So Yeah, uh, saw the saw the photo. A lot of interest and coverage of that, which we probably will mention in the papers about Dublin and the high ball and, and all of that. But like this was a thing that was evident last year with Dublin, you know, when they played Galway, even when they played Tyrone in the final, a few Hail Marys at the end causing problems. But it's... This is great news for Gaelic football because yeah. it really is. I mean, you're a Kerry man, I'm a Galway man. We, we'd like to think we're from counties that have a chance this year. And with the, the, with the narrative about football, the two problems football has had in recent years have been, I'm not sure which is worse, Dublin's dominance or the fact that you know the defensive game has become so, um, so dominant. And the fact now that Dublin clearly do look vulnerable. They've lost three games, whether you like it or not. They're not in the league final. And they definitely are vulnerable to a high ball. It's just, you know... Watching Cora Finn on 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 Monday, um, it, what was or rather on Sunday? What was interesting about that was. Cora Finn played a style of football that had so many Galway fans and general fans purring mm. and you contrast that to Kevin Walsh whose basic philosophy seems to be when Kevin Walsh is managing the Galway team the philosophy seems to be we're giving up the football at, at, at an absolute you know this is the worst thing we can do is give up the football unless we're sure we're using the ball properly and the idea of putting high balls into the full forward line which inevitably means there's a good chance you're going to lose the ball seems anathema to this Galway team and anathema to a lot of teams where it's possession, 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 possession and the old style of football still has a lot going for it yeah. ultimately and Tyrone went with Braun with two up front and it caused Dublin a lot of problems but the Curra Finn um, Galway thing will there will be a lot of pressure on Kevin Walsh now because everyone who watched Curra Finn will be saying that's how Galway traditionally play football it was amazing to watch obviously we will have those Curra Finn guys come back into the into the, into the panel um, but Kevin Walsh will be under a lot of scrutiny in Galway even though we're having a decent league campaign most people I talk to in Galway hate the way we play football yeah I was just about to ask there, there does tend to be that sort of sound coming out of Galway that they there is an acceptance that you do need a certain level of pragmatism to get to a certain point but then if Galway want to break the glass ceiling that pragmatism needs to be shifted a little bit mm. Dial needs to turn a tad, as Mike Quirk puts it in the Irish Examiner this morning, and I think he's right. Yeah, I, I, I've sympathy for Kevin Walsh because I don't think his natural inclination was to embrace the style of football that we've uh, become known for. But I think he he realised that Galway, um, you know, remember when we played Kerry a few years ago, we were absolutely destroyed defensively, and he realised that things had to change. Um, but if you look at Malloy's performance on Sunday, I, I was, I, I, you know, he's just. You know, the very fact even that he has a ponytail and he just has this kind of careless attitude or carefree attitude out in the pitch where it's the old style of, of playing football with abandon. And I texted a good friend of mine about him and he said, oh, he's, he, I can't wait to see him in Galway until Kevin Walsh puts the shackles on him. 
And unfortunately, like I, I would have, I know quite a few um, really uh, of the elder statesmen in Galway who don't watch Galway football, do not go to games anymore because of the style because of football. Because of the style. Yeah, and uh, this was, a, even a guy at home wouldn't go to Tune Stadium, which is up the road from us, would not watch Galway That's football. That's so they, they would absolutely would not, and these are diehard, diehard football men who basically watch almost no other sport, would not go to see Galway football, uh, footballers playing under Kevin Walsh. And I this would is, say more likely to go 10 years ago when, say, you had them playing nice football. Absolutely. You, you had Michael Meehan in his pomp. Oh, 100%. Were, it wasn't as effective as it is now. Um, well, how effective? Uh, effect, yeah. well, effective is probably the wrong word, as in yielding results to a point. Yeah, well, no, like if you look at last year, we, we won a Connacht title and we got to the Super 8s and we were beaten by Dublin. Um, on the face, but there's not a lot wrong with that. But exactly, I, th yeah. I think, you know, maybe we overstate this. It was kind of like uh, Sam Allardyce when he was at West Ham or whatever, you know, they never really liked, you know, West Ham, this is not how we play football. And maybe sometimes clubs love this idea or fans love this idea of their philosophy. But let's be honest, Galway football has, it has a trademark and the trademark has not been, the, the, the trademark it now has is completely at odds with what our trademark was for years where we did play you know, beautiful football, and I, I was brought, I was born, I suppose, in the eight, in in the early eighties. But I remember mid nineties, Bosco McDermott into Val Daly into um, John O'Mahony and and those teams, and ultimately the John O'Mahony teams, the unbelievable football we played when Kevin Walsh was a mainstay, and you know, nobody in Galway um, is, n certainly an awful lot of people in Galway um, would would be very very reluctant to watch this Galway team progress in the manner that it is now and would really pine for those days when we played nice football and you look at Malloy in the All-Ireland final and you're like, God, I'd love to see him play for Galway, but um, it's, it's interesting. I, do, I think football certainly needed the Dublin um, struggles in the league. I know they've had a lot of, um, they've had players out and they're, they're trialling players, but um, I think it's great for football. You think it's real, so? Yeah, I know. I do. I I think I I definitely think there's, there are signs of vulnerable, vulnerability there, and that, like that high ball into the full back line, that that that's been a uh, that just hasn't really been uh, tested enough on them. But um, like it, it's perfect actually in the context of Galway talking about it because ultimately you look at Tyrone over the past couple of years and. I don't know, I, I wasn't particularly sold on the bunch of players they had. And now you suddenly look at a full forward line of Matty Donnelly and Colin McShane and you're like, wait a minute, actually this Tyrone team is top class and perhaps the side of play was holding them back a little bit. Like, do Tyrone have better forwards than Galway? I think there's an argument to be made. No, they Probably don't. Probably not, yeah. But, I mean, going back to the all Ireland final last year, Tyrone really did not play that badly. And in f there was a lot of their football was very good. They were four points up, I think, in the first half. Um, little things at the back. Like, the, the, prob the problem is it's very hard to defend against. Against Dublin, that's 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 a, that no team seems to have really managed that. When Dublin go on a roll, they go on a roll, um, and if the, the Cluxton's kickout success has been such that it's very and football has become such a possession-based game, but. People who, who bemoan who, be, who moan about football and say that it is where it is, it is it is a game that's evolving at a really really fast rate, and that that's actually a good thing for football. I think, you know, m most people would say defensive systems now will get you so far, but they will only get you so far. And this is not so much that people are giving out about; it's just that the limitations of that um, style will obviously manifest itself eventually. And Regardless of, of what you say about the league, on Dublin have lost three games and they've lost in Crow Park to Toronto. To lose in Crow Park to Toronto, to me, is it is a little bit of a, a wake up call there. And I think it's great for Gaelic football. We, we because we look at that Kerry attack now, and we look at what Mayo are doing, and we look at Toronto, look at even Monaghan. There are teams there who can say we have a chance, and that and football needs it. At uh, the Irish Times this morning, leads with Six Nations, and it's Jerry Thornley's. Uh, that's the Times Ireland edition. Doherty is lined up for midfield role says the Times Ireland edition. Uh, so this is uh, Matt Doherty. Could be asked to slot into a midfield role for Ireland in Saturday's European Championship qualifier against Gibraltar. That's what uh, Nick McCarthy says. Now this is something that we've been speaking about for quite some time. The idea of how do you get Matt Doherty and Seamus Coleman in, into the Ireland team? And the suggestion was that maybe you know you put Seamus Coleman on the right of the three and you push Matt Doherty up into right wing back or potentially as midfield. I do remember Keith Andrews when he was in the Keith Andrews show here saying that Matt Doherty can't play on the half turn. That like you'd be better off playing him as a left back rather than a right midfielder, even though he plays on, on the right flank just because of his position uh, on the pitch and he's better behind the play uh, rather than ahead of it. So mm. it's an interesting one. And Mick McCarthy saying that it's definitely something they're looking at. Yeah, th but it's just been forced on him now probably with Odauda being out because um, obviously he's had to make all these changes but Odauda coming in from the right on his left foot to me looks like the logical thing I wouldn't necessarily play Seamus Coleman I'd, I'd prefer to play Doherty right back than Coleman but if you do want to fit Coleman into the team and he is captain I wouldn't be mad on Doherty at left back I think 
uh, just doesn't seem to suit him. But right back has changed a lot, Owen, and left back has changed because full backs now do a lot of attacking and teams are playing so narrow that there's not a straight shootout with the winger anymore. So Doherty playing on the right isn't isn't um, necessarily that much of a surprise purely because of doubt is out. But the fact that we're playing um, Gibraltar just gives us a chance to do things that, I mean, if we were playing Georgia, you, you, it's very hard to be kind of trial and, trial and error around the place because Georgia are going to put it up to us. This gives us a chance, but I have sympathy for Mick McCarthy. He's very little time to actually implant any sort of plan um, in general with this team in terms of we could play three at the back, we could play four at the back, we could play 4-4-1-1, four, four, one, one, we could play 4-5-1, four, 4-4-2, four, four, we could play 3-5-2. Um, I'm just, I think with Odoud out now, it's probably the logical option to put Doherty on the right. Yeah, uh, it's a soccer lead as well on the front of the Irish Examiner. It goes with take two as the headline, 23 years after his first time, Mick McCarthy leads Ireland training. And uh, show of friendship, Kieran O'Connor leads from the front as GA World gathers for Ada Walk. It's a great piece by Michael Moynihan, who's down there for that. And just a great show uh, of the, the spirit of the GA community once again. Uh, you've also got Crokes' guiding lights. Even in defeat, Magic of O'Shea and Cooper endures. That's Tony Lean writing this morning. And then you've got uh, a piece of Rory McIlroy and Joey Carberry and plenty more besides in the Irish Examiner Sports <coughs> Supplement. Uh, and then on to the Irish Times. Uh, as I say, it's Jerry Thornley's team in the tournament. What a difference a year makes as only two Irish make the cut. The fact that two Irish do make the cut in the Six Nations team of the tournament. Uh, so what a difference a year makes. What a difference like six weeks makes or yeah. whatever. Like the narrative from the New Zealand games to now, this is just an absolutely incredible turnaround. And as I was saying on Saturday, Willie Mullins, the difference of emotions he had in the Gold Cup where he had three of his first four, three of his four horses in the Gold Cup were gone halfway through it and then he ended up winning with the other. And the emotions he must have had in that, you know, six minutes or whatever. But the Ireland turnaround is, who could, I mean, we were odds on to win the Six Nations and we, we ended up being a ramshackle. Mm. Incredible. I, I, like you talk about narrative there. Like, do you use that word deliberately as in the, it's all overplayed one way or the other? The, it is. The narrative was overplayed when it was good. It is, but, but it, was over, it was overplayed um, after the England game. It was probably overplayed after the Italy game. But was it overplayed after the Wales game? Because we, we, we put now together, France were insipid against us, so we've put together, have we played one decent game in the Six Nations campaign? Arguably not. Start to finish, no. No, and, and the, the Wales game was atrocious. Now, it was kind of one of those days when things, were, a lot of things were going wrong at the same time. That's not a Joe Schmidt team, though. So much many things were malfunctioning um, I don't know I'm not, I'm not obviously a rugby man but the fact that we were second, hot, hot second favourites to win the World Cup going into it and now you're looking at us thinking Ooh, where are we going here and, and, and when you're talking about narrative has the whole Schmidt kind of leaving at the end of the year thing had, a, had a, made, made a difference I don't know a comment in here from Danny Murphy saying what did Mr Sheehan make of the Mayo game on Saturday I presume he's talking about me Thought yeah. they were excellent. Thought Aidan O'Shea was outstanding. I thought as well, I sat in here 13 months ago and complained about how the Mayo fans treated us in Castlebar. I thought they were exceptional on Saturday night. Uh, there's a real kind of... Uh, Mayo fans are, are they're a great bunch. I, 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 um, like, I, I kind of love to hate them usually, but I, I thought... Were you at the game? I was. I thought the particular crowd of Mayo fans who travelled down were... Many, many just, of them just down? Jubilant. They were just a great, great bunch of lads. Uh, to many of them over. down? A lot of them down. Huge. They're incre incredible That's supporters. Incredible. It helps when you see a performance like Aidan O'Shea. And like, I'm glad that I've had a couple of days to kind of calm down from Saturday night a little bit. I'd hate to be playing against Aidan O'Shea right now. Put mm. it that way. I'd hate to be anybody, including a, a Dublin player, going up against that player in that sort of form. Yeah. But whatever James Horn, like, I don't want to call him the Aidan O'Shea whisperer because Aidan O'Shea, I thought, has been excellent for the past couple of years, even post Horn. But he's been the Aidan O'Shea whisperer in terms of uh, turning him into a bit of a bastard again. Uh, yeah. That's in, in the nicest way possible. Sort of like the way Fernandinho... Five past eight in the morning and you're coming out with the B words. Sort, sort of like the way Fernandinho enforces the thing yeah. for, for Manchester City. Uh, O'Shea did the exact same thing for, for Mayo on Saturday night. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I'm sure many people would have had a bit of an issue with it. I kind of had no issue with it. I was kind of looking at him and I was like, Peter Keane, better look at what Ed O'Shea is doing and make sure that that sort of grit is instilled in some of the Kerry mm. players because that is how you become a winner. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see the game. I still have to catch up on the remainder of um, League Sunday. But... I was talking to a couple of Mayo guys actually at Cheltenham. A little bit sceptical about Horn that he's playing a good game with the media. He's talking up this team a lot, but they're not—they're not actually—they're not a million miles off. You would have to—you would have to say that. And if, if O'Shea comes back, you know, arguably still the hardest man in, in football nearly to mark if he's on his game. You know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you got the top lines this morning. Yeah, this one is interesting. From this is a hurl, John Aldridge. Um, Salah alarm bells ringing this is after the performance against Fulham I mean the horses bolted on the alarm bells with Salah Salah's not had a good campaign at all um, in my view I've said this time and time again I think in big games he's, he's been 
very, very um, found out this season. In my view, uh, he wasn't at it at the World Cup. He didn't get a break. And I think physically and mentally, he's just not at it now. But he's, he's got seven games without a goal. But in the six games, the top six that they've played this season, he's gotten one goal. That was against Arsenal, and Arsenal were absolutely rubbish at Anfield. And in Europe, I think he's done very little. He scored against Napoli, which I think is, I still think was a fluke. Um, and he, he's hanging on by a thread there. I, I thought he should have been dropped there in the campaign. And it's kind of the reason I don't think Liverpool will win the league now, because he's not playing well enough, and they're just scraping through games. Again, apparently didn't play well, obviously, on, on Sunday, but... Are, are you using that? Are you using the context of last season, though, to judge Mo Salah? Like, he has still he, scored, about 17 Premier League goals this season? doesn't really matter, on though. Like, their street... Like, they're playing, I mean, I was at the Burnley game. I mean, the difference in quality there, like, Liverpool are going to steam all these teams. They don't, meet, they don't need Salah to be beating Burnley and, t- and, pl- and teams like that. He didn't score either. It's the games, the games that matter ultimately, the games against the big, the, 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 top, uh, the top six, when, when he's been poor. I think next season he'd probably bounce back after a break, but this season, to me, he's never looked right. And when he's true on goal one-on-one now, you expect him to miss, basically. And that was the case against Everton. And if they lose the league, that Everton game could be absolutely pivotal. Um, I'm maybe being a bit harsh on him, but I don't think he's played well at all this season. Um, mix and match. This is in the Irish Daily Mail. Uh, Rory Compton, he can join elite club at Augusta and McCarthy set to pick Doherty and Coleman. And that is kind of the main, um, I suppose, that's the main headline from the, from the press conference yesterday. Um, mix them up. Uh, duo could start. This is in the sun. Uh, same narrative there. No more Ole Raps flops for playing like they did under Jose. Very poor performance. And meanwhile, Declan, I won't talk about Declan Royce, actually. Yeah, we'll get to that very, yeah, saving the best for last year. This is a really sour taste. There's a sour taste in my mouth when we get to Declan Rice shortly. <laughs> but the mirror, um, the world according to Zlatan, and Zlatan is obviously talking about um, the uh, kind of Ferguson, I suppose the ghost of Ferguson. I know he's still there, but Ferguson's shadow uh, in the in, in the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer era. Sour taste, Chelsea boss faces more pressure as players fear the season is... Uh, and Mick, I could just wing it with Matt, which is a pretty good headline there. Um, and this is the star. Forget about Fergie's Latin Ibrahimovic exclusive. Um, Alex is holding United back. Class of '92 need his permission to speak. Pog was the best. Plenty of stuff from Zlatan still still relevant. Um, broken jaw for Andrews and Doherty's key role. And obviously that's the star. Um, if you if you get the racing post today, David Jennings is a piece in Bryony Frost, and he makes an interesting point that um, jockeys need to be better in their post race interviews. That Bryony's interview was incredibly good for the sport when she won the Ryanair last week on Frodon. Um, I think he makes a valid point. Actually, I think she's she's very eloquent after straight after she she comes off. She's literally still on the horse and without like in almost in one breath she can give you an A to Z of what happened in the race. She's very fit, obviously, because that program was like Pegasus. He's got wings. Yeah, and uh, but she she reeled off this stuff like as if she she it was pre-rehearsed. This is disgusting. Uh, if you're really having a struggle on after your post bank holiday weekend, <laughs> young, gifted, and English. <laughs> That's the end of that paper. There is, uh, you've thrown the newspaper away now, but there is a new uh, bidder for Team Sky as well. So Team Sky is safe. Big good news for Team Sky fans this morning. And apparently they're going to have uh, more money than ever with the new backer. Britain's richest man is going in behind him. He's based in Monaco. And uh, it looks like Dave Reyes would have enough money in his hands uh, to keep all the main parts of his uh, Team Sky, former Team Sky, uh, in place for the Grand Tours this year.